Hello everyone and welcome back. This is episode number two of Vampire with a Podcast and I'm Charlie the Vampire. If you caught the first episode of this series, I promised to tell you how I became a vampire and even though I played with you a bit right out of the gate, I promised that on this episode I would tell you what actually happened to turn me from a normal 28 year old mortal man into one of the undead. So, let's get right into it. The story goes back about two years, maybe a little bit more, But let's just call it two years. At the time, I was married to my high school sweetheart, a woman named Ellie. We had known each other our whole lives, and we had gotten married at 18 years old, the summer right after our first year of college. It was stupid, I know, and people told us that we were too young, but we refused to listen to them because that's how young people are. So even though we had stayed together for almost 10 years and it wasn't perfect, We just didn't want to quit and admit that we had grown apart, even though it was clear that we had. Really, if we're being honest, the last four or five years, we had pretty much been living separate lives. But, on the occasion of our 10th year wedding anniversary, we both came to the conclusion that we either needed to improve the relationship or walk away from each other for once and all. So we ended up booking a trip to go on an Alaskan cruise for a few days. The cruise left from Vancouver and made its way up the coast with several ports of call along the way. We got to Vancouver a couple of days before the cruise ship was scheduled to leave and booked a hotel room right across the street from where it departed. The first night we were there, I went out onto the balcony of the hotel room and saw the ship had already docked. I guess they were in early to prepare for all the guests that would be loading up in a couple of days and uh... It was a big boat, so I imagine that would be a ton of work. The first night we were in Vancouver, well, really the first day, was pretty good. We did the touristy bullshit stuff all day and then went out for dinner in the evening. The next morning when we woke up, though, was when problems arise because Ellie wasn't feeling very well. We ended up in a hospital emergency room, and after a six-hour wait, the doctor told us that she had food poisoning. We went back to the hotel room after they gave Ellie some fluids through an IV for dehydration and I sat with her for a few hours. I don't really know how long it was, it seemed like forever. She apologized to me several times for ruining the day and then eventually suggested that I go out and get a drink seeing as how all she was going to do was sleep anyways. I didn't really want to leave her, but when it was clear that she was going to be okay, I decided to go get a couple of beers because I was bored. I made my way down to the lobby of the hotel and walked out onto the street. It was dark already, which surprised me, but I guess time had gotten away from me. I didn't know my way around the city, so I just kind of stood on the sidewalk looking around for a sign on a business that might suggest that they served alcohol. As I was looking around, my eyes went to the front door of the building across the street from the hotel. I watched a beautiful woman exit the building. She was tall, probably close to six feet, with dark hair and olive color skin. She was very exotic looking and smiled at me. I didn't know if she was smiling at me because she found me attractive or if because she thought I was just another dumbass tourist who didn't know his way around the city. I was standing in front of the hotel, so it could have gone either way. I stood there and watched as she walked away, and let me tell you guys, I liked what I saw. Damn, I said to myself, married or not, I wouldn't mind a night with a woman like that. I decided to follow her. I stayed back far enough so as not to be obvious, but I didn't want to stay so far back that I would run the risk of losing sight of her. So before I continue with the story, let's just get this out of the way. If you're wondering if I was feeling bad about stalking this young hot woman while my wife was back in our hotel room feeling like garbage, the answer is yes. I really did want to work on our marriage and I didn't want to cheat on her again. Yes, I said again because I have been unfaithful many times in the last 10 years. And I sincerely regret it, but this woman was something very special. At least physically she was, which honestly was all that mattered to me. It wasn't like I was looking for a long-term relationship. I can't explain it. I just felt compelled to follow her. She walked about two blocks and ended up going into this Irish pub. I waited a couple of minutes before going in because I didn't want to come in right on her heels. But I also didn't want to wait so long that some other young guy in there would hit on her and I would miss my chance. The pub itself was okay. It wasn't really upscale, but it wasn't a dump either. There were only five or six people there. 
A woman was sitting at the bar talking to someone on her cell phone, and there were three older guys sitting in a booth talking to each other about sports. They had all noticed the beautiful woman coming in and smiled at each other while making comments under their breath, but none of them seemed to have any interest in talking to her. There was a guy in his 30s with dark hair and a beard working behind the bar. I ordered a beer and sat at the other end of the bar as far away from the woman on the phone as I could get. Not that it helped as she had a few drinks in her and was talking loud enough that the whole place could hear her. I sat for three or four minutes sipping a beer trying to work up my nerve to talk to the beautiful woman when she came up to me and sat next beside or sat next to me. Can I ask you a question? She said, why are you following me? I looked at her and smiled and said, I mean, look at you. Can you blame me? You know, she said, if you're interested in a woman and you want a chance with her, probably stalking her is not your best move. I'm sorry, I said. I just felt compelled to follow you. It's not every day I see a woman as beautiful as you are. Is your wife beautiful, she asked. I never said I was married. Well, you are wearing a wedding ring, she said. I noticed that she had a bit of an accent and said, Where are you from? I've lived all over the world. It doesn't really matter. Are you married? Feeling like a dummy that I forgot to take off my wedding ring, I had to admit it, and I said, yes, I'm married. Where's your wife? She's back at the hotel room, I said. She isn't feeling well, so she told me to go out and get a drink. Ah, so instead, you decided to go out and try to get laid. I never said I wanted to get laid, I said. I just said I wanted to talk to you. Yeah, but you didn't talk to me, she said. I had to come and talk to you. You know, you're right. I didn't talk to you. Maybe because on some level I know I shouldn't be here. So, maybe I should leave. Well, you can leave if you want to, she said, but it's not like you've done anything wrong. Just because you're married, that doesn't mean you can't talk to another female, does it? I'm here to go on a cruise to Alaska with my wife to celebrate our 10-year wedding anniversary. 10 years? She sounded surprised. How old are you? I'm 28. Ah, so you got married as a child. Yes, I said, feeling slightly annoyed because I had heard that many times in my life. I got married very young. Ah, so that's why you're unhappy, she said. Whoa, I never said I was unhappy. Listen, you're here in Vancouver to go on an anniversary cruise, and yet you aren't with your wife. Instead, you're in a bar talking to some strange woman hoping to get into her pants. Well, believe it or not, I said, I do love my wife. Yeah, you may love her, but you're bored. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever actually had sex with a woman that isn't your wife? Yes, I said, I've had sex with lots of women. Oh, so then based on your age, she said, I can only assume you're a serial cheater. I guess I'm not that special after all. Yes, I admit that I have cheated in the past, but... That was the past, and I am going to change. I am going to become a better man. Sure you are, she said. That's why you're here. Can I buy you a drink, I asked. The conversation was getting a little bit too intense, so I decided to try and lighten it up some. No, the woman said, I'm not really here for booze. Really? Why are you here, I said, in this pub. For you, she said, winking at me. I'll let you in on a little secret. You are here right now because I want you here. You didn't follow me. I made you follow me. Oh, I see. You think smiling at me while I was standing in front of the hotel was enough to make me your lapdog. It's more than that, she said. Let me just say it this way. You have no say in what happens between us tonight. If I want to sleep with you, it will happen. I am in complete control. Really, I said... You definitely don't have any self-esteem issues, lady. I'm just saying, you don't have to feel any guilt or remorse about anything that happens tonight. Anybody I want, they are mine, male or female. Well, I said, you couldn't get a woman if she wasn't gay or bisexual. You wouldn't be able to do anything about that. Gay or straight means nothing when it comes to me, she said. I get what I want. Well, you know... You are one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen, I said. And you know it. You really like yourself. 
Let me prove it to you, she said. The first female that walks into this bar that I like, I'll go over and talk with. I guarantee you that she will come back to my place and that she will have sex with me. I'll even let you watch. Are you serious, I asked. Very, she said. And if you get really lucky and I'm in a good mood, I may even let you join in. Okay, I said. I'm not going to say no to that. Exactly, she said. No matter how much a man claims to love his wife, if the woman is attractive enough and the man thinks he can get away with it, he will cheat. That's why women are always struggling in relationships. See, every woman resents the man she is with no matter how hard he tries to please her and give her what she wants. The problem is, women have an idea in their head of what they think a man should be and should do for them, and the man that she picks can't possibly be somebody he isn't, no matter how hard he tries, no matter how much he wants to please her. Yes, I said, thinking of Ellie, especially when that woman won't tell you what she thinks you should be, or why she thinks she has the right to tell you what you need to be. Right, the woman said, so she gets resentful and abusive, picking fights with her man just to get some revenge. But then her real problem begins when her man leaves and goes out into the real world, sick of her bullshit. She then realizes that any other woman who might be attracted to her man can easily steal him away from her. So you're saying that women don't really want the man they are with, but they also don't want him to move on to another woman because they don't want to lose to her. Yes, that's why all women hate each other. No matter how nice I was to my female friends, well, when I had them, none of them ever trusted me to be around their men. Funny thing is, I never had any interest in any of their men to begin with. Why? Because you knew you could actually do much better? You can buy me that glass of red wine now, she said. Let's go sit in a booth. My name is Charlie, I said, and you are? Katrina, she said, and Charlie, I think you and I are going to be friends for a really long time. Eh, I'm not sure my wife would be okay with that, I said. What she doesn't know can't hurt her, Katrina answered. Or you. So I ordered a bottle of red wine and we went to the booth. I thought about what Katrina said and started feeling a bit down. If she was right about how women behaved in relationships, it basically meant that Ellie and I would never be happy. Was she right? I don't know. I think her idea that all men would cheat under the right circumstances is wrong. Yes, I admitted to her and you guys that I have cheated, but does that mean that every man is a cheater? I think I've known a few men over the years that wouldn't have cheated on their wives, and it wouldn't matter how unhappy they were, they still just wouldn't do it. I've thought about those guys and tried to figure out what made them different than me. There were two things that came to my mind. The first was that they were religious and believed at the end of at the time of their deaths, they would be judged by their maker. Me, I didn't have any religious hang-ups. Let's just say I never thought following a book of rules written and edited by a bunch of people that never met their God they claimed to believe in made much sense. The second thing I came up with as to why some guys never cheated on their wives, even though they had the chance, was because they had children and didn't want to hurt them and run the risk of their kids hating them should they get caught. I realized my thoughts were starting to get too dark and too serious for the moment, so I poured myself a decent sized glass of wine. Truth is, I don't even really like wine, but the pretty woman did, so what the hell, I played along. We sat and made small talk while we waited for a woman to walk through the door, a woman that Katrina guaranteed she could seduce. It took almost half an hour before an early 20s ginger walked into the bar with her meathead boyfriend. They got drinks at the bar and went over to the pool table and started playing a game. N neither one of them had any ability, but the meathead talked like he had skills. You know, Katrina said, in ancient Greece, when they buried a redhead, they would stake them through the heart with a wooden stake because they believed gingers were soulless and would come back as vampires if they didn't stake them. Damn, I said, poor gingers, disrespected for thousands of years. 
And rightly so, Katrina added. They are really kind of creepy. Either way, I don't want to sit here all night, so I guess this one will have to be my sex slave. You don't have to do this, I said. You and I, you and I can leave here and go somewhere more private. Nah, she said. I bet's a bet. What about her boyfriend, I asked, looking at the big meathead. Ah, don't worry about him, Katrina said. He'll be dealt with. Okay, I said, whatever you want. Hey, Katrina said, listen, if you're feeling guilty about what we're about to do tonight, I don't think you should. Well, I shouldn't be proud of it, I said. Let me ask you something. Do you think your wife ever cheated on you? You're so busy feeling guilty about what you've done that I'll bet you've never even stopped to ask yourself that question. Katrina walked away from me before I could answer. I watched her walk up to the ginger girl and start talking to her. Her boyfriend noticed but never said anything. I guess he didn't feel threatened by a woman. I thought about Katrina's question as I sort of watched her. Had Ellie ever cheated on me? My honest answer is I don't know. My instinct tells me no, but there was one incident that happened a few years back that made me wonder if she was interested in one of her Facebook friends. You know how you can tag somebody in a video post that you think they might like? Well, I did that one day and she got really mad about it and I could never figure out why. At the time, I assumed that she didn't want her work friends to know I existed. Maybe she was embarrassed about being so young when we got married. But, I mean, guess I guess looking back, it could be that she was interested in some guy that she didn't want to know I was still in the picture. It's weird because it's not like I overdo the sharing or tagging thing, so I don't know why she reacted with so much anger. Even a couple days ago, I noticed if she sees something she likes, she'll tag people online, but I'm never one of them. Me, I always get sent whatever it is in a private message. One time when she was mad at me about something, she told me she never talks about me at work, making me think she was almost embarrassed by me or something. But maybe she had other reasons. I guess I'll never know. Anyway, I didn't want to think about that right now, so I might brought my focus back to Katrina. She had her arms around the ginger girl and she whispered something in her ear. They both laughed and Katrina walked away. As she walked towards me, I took a second to admire her physical beauty, but I also took a second to think about how she might be trying to manipula manipulate my feelings towards my wife. Grab your coat, she said. Let's go back to my place. What about the girl, I asked. She'll join us later. So there we were, walking down the street back towards Katrina's apartment, which was also right across the street from my hotel. We didn't really speak much until we got back in front of her building when she stopped and suddenly threw her arms around me and planted a passionate kiss on me. It lasted a good 20 seconds, and while I enjoyed it, I was also concerned that Ellie could look out the window at any time and see me making out with this woman, and I don't think that would have went over too well on our 10th year wedding anniversary trip. So we walked towards the front door of her building. I reached out for the door, but before I could open it, the door came open and a giant of a man appeared in front of us, well over seven feet and wide. Good evening, my lady, he said to Katrina. Hello, Malcolm. My friend Charlie and I will be heading to the rooftop. We have another guest coming to join us, so please be a dear and show her up when she arrives. Of course, he said as he eyeballed me. It would be my pleasure. We made our way to the rooftop. It was cold and dark, and there was no real reason to be up there. I knew Katrina was up to something, but I didn't know what it was. I decided to just ask her why we were up on the rooftop, but she, an but she answered before I could get the words out. I know you don't want to have sex with that girl I picked up at the bar, Katrina said. You weren't attracted to her from the beginning, and neither was I. So what are we doing here? I asked. You're going through a rough time in your life, Katrina said. Ten years of marriage and you, you've you honestly been unhappy, most of them. You stay with your wife out of loyalty. And this idea that you have to stay or you failed. Like time is the only factor in a successful marriage. You don't even know me, I said. Why the hell do you care? I like you, Katrina said, and I want to help. Help how? I want to show you there are things in this world that are possible and that you could be so much more if you really wanted to be. How are you going to show me that? 
Wait until our guest arrives, Katrina said. I want to show you what I can do and then give you the opportunity to have the same abilities that I have. You know what, Katrina? I have no idea what you're talking about. Patience, Charles. Patience, Katrina said. Our guest will be here soon enough. The girl from the club showed up after an uncomfortable 20 minutes of sitting with Katrina and not really speaking. Malcolm led the girl to the rooftop patio and turned around and walked away without saying anything. Katrina walked up to the girl and hugged her again and said, What's your name? Sammy, the girl said. She looked over at me and smiled. Are you two ready to party? She looked a bit heavier than I remembered her looking at the pub, and I really wasn't attracted to her. In the club, her hair looked more strawberry blonde, but now here on the rooftop, she looked like a straight-up ginger. Yuck, I thought to myself. I don't want any part of this. Sammy, Katrina said, I need you to look into my eyes and focus. Okay. I need you to do everything I ask you to do without question. Can you do that? Yes. Katrina said, great. The first thing I need you to do is to take off your dress and underwear. I stood there and watched as this girl took off all her clothes without a second thought. It was weird. She had this vacant look in her eyes like she wasn't fully there. I took a few steps forward so I could get a better look at what was going on, and I noticed this Sammy girl had tattoos all over her chest, stomach, and legs. Not a look I really liked, but it didn't matter because I knew this wasn't about sex. Katrina was doing something to this girl's mind, and it, I felt like I knew it wasn't going to end well. I just had that feeling in the pit of my stomach. You know the one you get when you know something is about to go very badly. Well, Katrina said as she turned and looked at me, Do you like what you see? Should we do this, bitch? Katrina, I don't know what you're planning on doing. Are you attracted to this woman? Katrina asked. No. I just want to know what's going on here. You don't know her and you aren't attracted to her, so why do you care? I really don't understand what is going on. What is this? I want to show you what is possible for my kind. I want you to see the possibility in this world. Please, just stop doing what you're doing and let her leave. What makes you think I would harm her, Katrina said. We're just having a little bit of fun here. Just let me show you what I can do. Katrina, I said, please. Malcolm, Katrina yelled. The giant appeared almost immediately. Are you hungry? I could eat, Malcolm said. Katrina, I said as I walked towards her, can I just talk to you for a minute? I guess, Katrina said. Sammy, could you walk to the back of the building? My friend wants to talk in private. I watched as the girl walked past me into the back of the building, just as Katrina had commanded her to do. It was like some kind of mind control, but that didn't make sense, did it? A thought occurred to me as I turned to face Katrina. She had a big smile on her face. Do you two know each other? I asked. We just met. Are you sure? You've got me all freaked out up here, but I'm starting to think this is all just some kind of sick game to mess with me. Why are you doing this? I'm not trying to mess with you. I'm not trying to freak you out, Katrina assured me. You will freak out, but that is not my intention. Honestly, I'm just trying to reveal my real self to you. I've been so lonely. You're saying that you've never met this Sammy person before tonight? No, and I'll prove it to you. Sammy, can you do me a small favor? Yes, Sammy said. What do you need? I need you to jump off the rooftop of this building and kill yourself. Okay, Sammy said. With no emotion. She climbed up onto the ledge of the building and put her arms out at her side. I could tell by the way she did that it was really that she was really going to jump. I screamed at her not to do it and tried to run towards her, but Katrina grabbed me by the arm to stop me from running. I could not believe how strong she was. This was not human strength. No, I screamed, but it didn't do any good. Sammy jumped off the building. Do you believe me now, Katrina said with an evil smile on her face. I told you. I didn't know her. Oh my God, I said. Oh my God, what just happened? 
You have no God, Charles, and you know it. You believe in right here, right now, just like me. Living in the moment, Charles, that's your real religion. Why'd you kill her? You didn't have to do that. Sure I did. You heard Malcolm say he was hungry, didn't you? We are so screwed. No, we aren't. Malcolm will take care of it. Besides, you didn't do anything wrong. Come on, Charlie. I'll show you out. The three of us got into the elevator and rode it to the lobby. We didn't speak much, and when the elevator let us off on the main floor, the giant went out a back door, and I was left standing with Katrina in the lobby. I kind of hated myself for thinking about how beautiful she was after I had just watched her kill a woman in cold blood with no remorse for no apparent reason. What the hell was wrong with me? Charlie, it was a real pleasure meeting you. I hope that I will see you when you come back from your cruise. I don't think so, Katrina. After the cruise, I'm heading back to Toronto. I don't see any reason why we should meet again, especially after what just happened. As you wish, Charles. It was a pleasure meeting you. Katrina walked to the elevator and I watched as she got in. She smiled at me and before the doors closed she said, By the way, if I was in your shoes I would not go to the back of the building to see what Malcolm is doing. I promise you, it isn't pretty. The elevator door closed and Katrina was gone. I stood in the lobby for a minute trying to decide what I should do. One thing that I knew I wasn't going to do was call the cops. I walked out of the front door of the lobby and was prepared to walk across the street to the hotel, but for some reason, I really wanted to see what Malcolm was doing. Probably because Katrina had told me that I shouldn't go back there. I really wanted to. At least I thought I did until I made my way down the alleyway to the back of the building. I saw Malcolm sitting on the pavement next to the splattered body of the dead girl. He had pulled one of her limbs off and was biting into it like a freaking piece of chicken. I ran back up the alleyway to try to get to the street, but I didn't make it. I had to stop and puke my guts out all over the side of the building. Damn it, I said. I will never get that visual out of my head. I didn't sleep that night. I sat in a chair and watched Ellie sleep. I turned the TV on in the hotel room and put on the 24-hour news channel to see if there was anything on the girl that Katrina had forced to jump off the building. There was nothing. How the hell did she do that? With her mind, I asked myself out loud. I never came up with an answer, but my talking woke Ellie up. Charlie? What time is it? Early morning, I said. How are you feeling? Still kind of rough. Did you have a good night? Uh, not really. I went to a pub and had a few drinks. When I got back, you were sleeping. Did you meet anyone? No, not really. I talked with a few people in the bar, but I have to say, Vancouver isn't a very friendly city, especially when they find out you're from Toronto. I'm sorry I'm being such a stick in the mud. I wish we could have done something together. Nah, it's fine. I said, you're sick, not your fault. Listen, if you're not up to doing this, we can just call it off and go back home. No, I'm sure I'll be okay in a couple of days, Ellie said. It's our 10th year wedding anniversary. We've got to go. I agreed to go, but honestly, I was a bit disappointed that she didn't want to go home. I was starting to get a feeling that this trip wasn't going to be the best thing for our relationship. Anyways, I ended up waiting while Ellie took a shower, and then we made our way over to the cruise ship. It took us about an hour to get through customs and all the other nonsense they put you through, but eventually we made our way into our room. The room itself was pretty basic for what this trip was costing. I was seriously thinking about throwing myself overboard before we even left the port. I just don't enjoy organized events and wasn't keen on spending my time with a bunch of strangers. I know you're wondering, well, why was I there in the first place then? Because Ellie always wanted to go on a cruise and I felt that I owed her something that she wanted to do. This was the shortest cruise that I could find that didn't go somewhere that was super hot because I don't like real hot. I have very pale skin and I just don't like the feeling of the hot, humid air that everybody seems to be so fascinated with. Anyways, we unpacked a little bit and then they had us report to this general assembly thing where this extremely loud woman with a booming voice went over safety rules and regulations got into planned events, time for formal meals, and so on. It kind of felt like joining a cult, if I'm being honest. I noticed during all the talking that Ellie was really struggling to keep it together. I had never seen her look so sick. 
and I was on the verge of telling her we needed to get the hell off the ship. I don't think this is food poisoning, she whispered in my ear. I think it's something much worse. Like what? I don't know, maybe the fucking plague. I might need to go see the ship doctor if this yappy bitch ever shuts the fuck up. I knew Ellie was sick because she never swore. When all the talking came to an end, I asked her if she wanted to go find the doctor. She said no, that she just wanted to sleep a few more hours, and that if she didn't feel better after that, we could go to the doctor. I have to get inside, she said. The sun is, since the sun has come out, I'm really starting to feel worse than I did before. So we ended up going back to our room where once again Ellie apologized to me for being sick and told me to go out and find something to do. She told me that we would do something together on day two. I told her I would stay, but much like the night before, she insisted that I go. Eventually I agreed to go out and look around, although I had no idea what I was going to find on the stupid boat. By the way, Charlie, tomorrow when I'm feeling better, we need to talk about something really important. Sure, I said, feeling guilty. I wondered if she was going to confront me about all the times I had cheated on her. Sometimes I felt like she knew. Get some rest. We'll talk later. I know in the last podcast I told you guys that I had only ever been with Ellie, but that was a lie. I was trying to deceive you into thinking that I was some kind of stand-up guy so that you wouldn't figure out I was already a vampire when I met Jesse. By the way, for those of you that reached out to me about what happened with Jesse after I turned her... I'll get to that story some other time. It's really kind of interesting and not exactly what I was expecting. By the time I made it up to the deck, the sun had already gone, lost behind the fog of Vancouver. I stood on the deck and watched as the city disappeared as we headed north. I probably stood there by myself for at least an hour. I checked my phone a few times to see if there was any news on the dead girl that Katrina had killed, but there was nothing. In that moment, I decided that I wasn't going to think about it anymore. I had done nothing wrong and I couldn't exactly go to the police with this crazy story of a monster who ate the flesh of a woman who had jumped off of a building because a beautiful woman had used her ability to control the minds of others to make her jump. They would have locked me up in a loony bin. I decided there was nothing left for me to do but spend the rest of this vacation getting as drunk as I possibly could and then when it was over head back to Toronto and forget that I was ever here. The question was would I be heading back to Toronto as a single man? Or would I still be married? Was I overreacting when Ellie said we needed to talk? I found a bar on the ship and started drinking. There was a terrible lounge singer belting out some of the old classics that, to me, were never any good anyways. But the drunker I got, the less it bothered me. After an hour or so, I had had enough of the place and I went to wander around. I found a casino and made my way in. Now, gambling is not really my thing. I have enough money and don't really care about it, but I had time to kill, so I gambled. I ended up making around 500 bucks before losing it all. I was so drunk when I left that I had trouble walking. I found a lounge chair on one of the upper decks and passed out in it. Not sure how long I was out, but the sound of a woman calling my name woke me up. Charlie, the woman said. Are you okay? I opened my eyes expecting to see Ellie standing there, but it wasn't her. Imagine my surprise when I saw Katrina standing in front of me. She was dressed all in black and looked as amazing as ever. I did not see her giant bodyguard anywhere. Thank God. I rubbed my eyes and tried to wake up. Actually, I was trying to figure out if I was dreaming or not. Katrina, how did you get here? Yeah, uh, I might have forgot to mention last night that I too was booked to come on this cruise. Great, I said, as I looked around the deck of the cruise ship. It was pitch black and nobody else was around. No offense, but I was trying to forget that I ever met you and that last night ever happened. I'm sorry you feel that way. I mean you no harm, Charlie. Give me a chance to prove to you that I'm your friend and that you want me in your life. I don't think that's such a good idea. Like I said before, I think we should just go our separate ways. Why? So you can spend the rest of your 10th year wedding anniversary by yourself? Ellie is sick. Yeah, Katrina said. But sick of what? You, maybe. I don't want to talk about this. Okay, Katrina said. Listen, fair enough. Anyway, I just wanted to apologize for last night. I shouldn't have depressed you by talking about your life and your failing marriage. 
Really, we should have kept the conversation more casual and went back to my apartment and had sex. Too late now, I said. No, it isn't. I have a room. We can go back to and it doesn't look like Elliot's going to want to do anything with you anytime soon. Seriously, I said. Are you kidding me? No, why would you say that? Katrina asked. You think I want to be alone with you after what I saw you do and what I saw your bodyguard do after that woman jumped to her death? Yeah, why not? Well, I'm a little bit concerned about what you might do to me. Oh, come on, Charlie. If I wanted to harm you, I already would have. Look around. Everyone's in their rooms right now. We're alone. I don't want to harm you. Yeah? What about your giant? He won't do anything to you unless I tell him to, and as I've already explained to you, I like you and wish you no harm. Uh, I should head back to my room. Why? You just want to sit there all night and watch your sick wife sleep? I'm trying to be a better person, Katrina. I'm trying not to cheat. But you will. If not with me, you will have a moment of weakness and cheat with some other woman. Yeah, if she doesn't break up with me first. What do you mean by that? Katrina asked. Ellie told me that she needs to talk to me about something serious when she is feeling better. Look, Charlie, I'm not going to twist your arm. If you don't want to do this, you don't have to. I don't have to beg men to sleep with me. I'm going to have to put you on the spot here. I'm going back to my room now. You are welcome to join me, or you can walk away and go back to your wife. Either way, no hard feelings. Yeah, so I'm not proud of the decision I made, but you already see it coming. Of course, I decided to follow her back to her room. As much as I wanted to be a better person, I just couldn't do it. While I was off on my own getting drunk, and I had this thought that I might be better off if Ellie ended things with me. If it was her choice, I wouldn't have to feel guilty about leaving her behind. A few drinks later, though, I realized that I had never lived alone before and wasn't sure that I wanted to start now. I felt like it might be boring and lonely. So as I sat there and I drank, I just started to fantasize about what type of woman I would replace her with. I have to be honest, though, I wasn't necessarily thinking about Katrina. Her looks, sure, but not her specifically. The whole murder an innocent woman with her mind control trick was quite the turn off. So why am I following her back to her room right now? Is it just for sex? No, honestly. As scared as I was, there was part of me that really wanted to know who and or what she was. Her and her monster were the first things I had ever seen in my life that gave me this sort of supernatural vibe. Before last night, I figured the truth about the world was pretty much what you see is what you get. Most of us live pointless lives until we die, usually unhappy. A handful of people mourn our deaths, but for the most part, the world goes on without us. And we just aren't part of it anymore. Until last night, I figured we all lived in the same shallow corporate world where the big corporations mean more than people. But after last night, I've been wondering if there's more and if somehow I could be part of it. The problem with my curiosity, of course, was that it could get me killed. If Katrina decided that she had enough of me or didn't want me to know stuff that I wanted to know. Have you ever noticed that for a woman to be really attractive, she has to have a little bit of evil in her? You have to see it in her eyes. Well, guys, let me tell you, Katrina had that look more than any other woman I have ever seen in my life. I followed her to her room and she stopped in front of the door. I looked around for the giant but didn't see him. Katrina wrapped her arms around my shoulders and kissed me. If we're going to do this, she said as I looked into her seductive evil eyes. I want this to be just about us. No thinking about your life back home, your wife or your marriage. If we go into that room, I want to be your everything at least for the time that we're together. I want to be all you see, feel, and touch. Of course, it's all about you, I said. No, Charlie. It's all about us. So we went into her room, which was pretty much identical to the room Ellie and I had. She told me to have a seat on the bed and went into the bathroom. While I was sitting on the bed, I started to feel guilty about what I was doing. But when Katrina came out of the bedroom completely naked, well, let's just say the blood left my brain and went somewhere else. Like I said before, Katrina with her 
dark hair, olive skin, and athletic body was easily the most physically beautiful female I had ever seen. I can't think of a movie star, past or present, that even comes close to her. Join me in the shower, she said. So that's it. That's how it started. The night that would change my life forever. Well, I guess technically the night that would end my life. Katrina was a violent lover. She did a lot of slapping and hair pulling and biting when she got into it. At least that's how she was when we were in the shower. When we made our way to the bedroom, she became a little bit more gentle and a little bit more romantic. I think we'd been in bed for over an hour when she finally decided to let me know what she really was. She was on top of me and I had my eyes closed. She put her mouth by my left ear and whispered something to me. She was breathing real heavy and... Her voice sounded kind of weird, almost distorted, but I thought that she asked me if I wanted to see what she really was, so I said yes. Good. Then open your eyes, Charlie. I opened my eyes and pretty much regretted that decision immediately. Katrina's pretty perfect face was gone, and in its place was the hideous face of a monster. Pale skin, almost scaly, with bright red eyes and a mouth full of razor-sharp fangs were looking down at me. It was the most unreal thing I had ever seen, to the point where I started to wonder if it was even real. I wondered if maybe I had fallen asleep after sex and was dreaming all of this. Those thoughts wouldn't last long, though, when she made a move for the left side of my neck. God, did it hurt, as her fangs ripped into my flesh. I tried to yell the word stop to her, but no sound would come out. I put my hands on her breasts and tried to push her off of me, but I couldn't even budge her. I didn't understand how she could be so strong and how I could be so weak, and the thing was, I was getting weaker by the second. It was really a strange and terrifying feeling, but I could actually feel the blood leaving my body. Don't resist me, my love, Katrina said, as she took a break from draining my blood. I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to make you like me. A vampire, I said, sounding really weak. Yes, Katrina said. You are about to become Charlie the Vampire. So that's all I remember before everything went black. The next thing I remember is waking up underwater. I don't know how long I had been out for, but when I opened my eyes and saw that I was underwater, I panicked, as you can imagine. It was dark in the room, but I could see a little bit. I looked around the room to see where Katrina was, but I didn't see her. I swam to the bathroom and looked in. The door was already open and she wasn't in there. I didn't know how much time I had before I would be out of breath, so I swam to the front door and tried to open it. It wouldn't budge. Probably due to the huge amount of water on either side of the door, I looked around the room for any for another way out and didn't see it. I looked around to see if there was anything I could use to smash the door, which probably wouldn't work anyways, but I couldn't find any heavy objects, so I just sort of gave up. I just sort of floated there, looking around the room, wondering how long it was before I drowned, and wondered if it was going to be painful, hoping that it wouldn't be painful. I had pretty much given up hope that the cavalry was coming to save me, but boy was I wrong. Even though I was underwater, I could hear the hotel room door, well, not the hotel room, but the, the hotel room on the cruise ship, Katrina's room, I could actually hear it explode when the giant Malcolm put his huge fist through it. He looked at me and motioned me to, and motioned at me to follow him, so I swam behind him and he led me to the surface of the water. The ship had sunk into quite a depth and I was shocked at how far underwater we actually were. Holy crap, I screamed as I tried to take a deep breath. What the hell happened? You're okay, Charlie. Malcolm talked in his usual monotone voice. It was pitch black and I could barely see him. You need to swim to the shore. It's quite far and you must go. I don't even know where the shore is. Look behind you. You can see the lights of the lifeboats heading that way. No, I can't go. I have to find Ellie. She's gone, Charlie. You need to start swimming. How do you know she's gone? She can't be gone. She can't be dead. I didn't say she's dead. I said she's gone. 
She was put on one of the boats. She looked for you but couldn't find you and was forced onto a boat by the crew. If you want to see her again, start swimming. I can't do it, I said, as I looked at how far away the shore was. Somebody had a fire going on shore, and although I couldn't exactly figure out how far it was, I knew it was too far for me to swim, what with the water being so cold and the fact that I was naked. Charlie, damn it, you need to listen to me. I don't know if you remember what happened, what Katrina did to you or not, but you aren't exactly a human being anymore. You are turning into something else. If you were a normal person, you'd be dead already. So start swimming. Katrina, I said, where is she? I'm going back for her. I'll come with you. No, Katrina is fine. You are in more danger. Swim. We will see you on land. And with those words, he disappeared underwater, and I was left alone in the middle of the Pacific Ocean at night. The water was really choppy, and I took in a mouthful of seawater, which made me feel sick. Sicker than I already did. I took a moment to catch my breath and try to control my nerves. It took a little bit of doing to convince myself that this wasn't a dream and that I was really going to have to swim to shore. It looked to be at least a mile and I wasn't the strongest swimmer. And I didn't really like the water, but my situation was I either hauled ass to shore or I died. I started to swim and hoped that one of the lifeboats would come back to get me, but I realized that it was something that I couldn't count on. Malcolm said you can make it, I said to myself. He said you won't freeze to death. Of course, he's a monster who eats people, but right now he's the only one on your side, so start swimming, Charlie. You've got this. And don't think about sharks. So I started swimming, and after a couple minutes or so, I heard a large splash behind me, and of course, my first thought was it was a shark and that I was dead. I let out a bit of a girlish scream, but fortunately, nobody was around to hear it. I wanted to look back, but I decided not to and kept swimming. If it was a shark, I definitely couldn't outswim it and make my way back to shore, so I decided to ignore it and hope I didn't get attacked. Whatever it was, it never came after me. I swam for about 20 minutes and then stopped to look around. I didn't feel like I was getting any closer to the shore. I cursed, unsure of what to do, but in the end, I didn't really have any choice but to keep swimming. You make it or you die. It's as simple as that. I can't tell you how long it took, but it felt like a couple of hours before I finally reached the shore. Remember that fire that I saw on the beach that I was swimming towards? I somehow lost sight of it and ended up on a part of the shoreline where there weren't any people. At least, no living people. As I crawled my way onto the, out of the ocean and onto the shore... I came to see a gruesome sight. There were half a dozen dead bodies that had washed up on shore. Two women, a couple kids, and a man holding a child of around three years of age. I felt sick like I wanted to vomit, but there was nothing in me to throw up. I collapsed to my knees and looked up at the sky and said a few curse words to a god that I didn't believe in. You aren't real, I said. If you were, shit like this wouldn't happen. I took a moment to compose myself. It didn't take long for me to realize that I was freezing cold and that I needed to find something to wear. I looked at the dead guy that was holding the child and wondered if I should take his clothes. He was around my size, I might have been a bit taller and he was a bit heavier, but his clothing would be better than nothing. I didn't want to do it and really wasn't sure if it would matter anyway, seeing as his clothes were soaking wet. I got to my feet and looked down at him, not sure of what to do, when I heard a noise coming from the water. I looked to see what it was and saw the unmistakable figure of Malcolm the Giant coming towards me. He was close enough to the shore that I could see him walking in the shallow water carrying something large over his head. I stared in his direction and waited to see what it was. And as he got closer, I could see that it was a coffin. I have some clothes for you in the coffin. Is Katrina also in there? Of course. He opened up the lid, and I watched as Katrina sat up. Charlie, Katrina said, sounding surprisingly happy. I'm so glad to see you. I walked over to the coffin and helped Katrina climb out. Katrina, what the hell happened? Why did the ship sink? I don't know. Like you, I was asleep. Charlie, Malcolm said as he took my suitcase out of the coffin and threw it at my feet. You don't look well. You need to get dressed. The survivors are up the beach about a mile. The Mounties and the Canadian Coast Guard are up there, and the American Coast Guard is coming to help them out. If you want to say goodbye to Ellie, you have to get up there before sunrise. 
What do you mean if I want to say goodbye? Why would I want to say goodbye? Charlie, Katrina said. I bit you. You are going to become a vampire. Allie can't be part of your life from this point forward. It isn't safe for her. What do you mean? I would never hurt her. Yes, you will. When your bloodthirst is at its strongest, no human being will be safe around you. You can't be friends with a human or lovers with one that you don't want to hurt. Why did you do this to me? I said as I collapsed to my knees. Why would you do this? Because I love you, Charlie. And I want you for myself. You don't have much time, Charlie, Malcolm said. Sun comes up in just under three hours. If you want to say goodbye, you've got to get going. I don't think I can do it, I said. I have a problem. I'm really fatigued, and as of about 20 seconds ago, I can no longer see. What are you saying, Charlie? Katrina asked. I'm saying I'm fucking blind. I can't see a thing. Charlie. Katrina crouched down beside me on the beach and put her arm around me and said, You need to relax. You'll get your sight back. You took in some seawater, and the salt has slowed down your transformation. If it wasn't for the cruise ship sinking, you'd already be a full vampire. Close your eyes and relax. I see boats coming this way. They'll take you into the nearest town where they've set up a medical center, and you'll see Ellie. Malcolm and I will be with you every step of the way, but nobody else will know we're there. Close your eyes and relax. We've got your back. I think I passed out because I don't remember anything else that happened on the beach after Katrina stopped talking. The next thing I remember is waking up inside of some tent with a nurse looking down at me. My vision was blurry, but I could see again. It was loud, and people in different types of uniforms were running around. I saw other people on stretchers or gurneys, whatever the hell they're called. Sir, the nurse said, can you speak? Yes, I said. What is your name? My name is Charlie. Okay, Charlie, listen to me. You are very sick, but I need you to stay calm and try to rest. Helicopters are going to start moving people like you to Anchorage, Alaska, as soon as the sun comes up. No sun, I said, but the nurse had walked away before I had gotten the words out of my mouth. All I knew was I needed to find Ellie. I collapsed again, and as it turns out, I didn't have to find Ellie at all because she found me. When I opened my eyes, I saw her looking down at me. She looked scared. We locked eyes for a moment, and I waited for her to say something. But when she didn't, I decided to speak. I'm sorry about all the things I did. I'm sorry, Ellie. I was a terrible husband. But I love you, and I wish I could take it all back. I wish I could fix the past. After my sincere and heartfelt apology to Ellie, she didn't say a word. She just turned and walked away. And that was it. That was the last time I ever saw my high school sweetheart and wife of 10 years. The next thing I remember is waking up in the pitch black to complete and total silence. I had no idea where I was, but when I tried to sit up, I smashed my face into something that was just above me. I was stuck wherever I was for hours in the dead silence, just hoping that somebody would come for me. Eventually, they did. I heard the sound of two people talking, one male and one female. They sounded far away at first, but as they got closer, I could make out that it was, in fact, Katrina and Malcolm. Can't you dig him up any faster, I heard Katrina say. Five minutes, I'll have him out. Holy shit, I whispered to myself when I realized that I was in a coffin underground. Katrina and Malcolm had come to dig me out of my own grave. Get me the hell out of here, Malcolm. Katrina, please. I'm freaking out. I'm not sure if they heard me, but if they did, they didn't acknowledge me. True to his word, Malcolm got me out in about five minutes. I could feel my coffin moving as he pulled it from the ground, and when he opened the lid and I saw Katrina's beautiful face looking at me, I started to laugh like a lunatic. I have never been so happy to see anyone as I am to see you two right now, I said. I tried to sit up in the coffin, but couldn't do it without a little help from Katrina. Oh my God, I said. What the hell? You're okay now, Charlie, Malcolm said. Where are we, I said as I looked around. 
We're in a graveyard, Malcolm said, stating the obvious. Are we in Toronto? No, Katrina said, we're in Vancouver. Your heartbeat got so weak that you were declared dead. And Ellie buried me in a cemetery in a city I'm not from? Why the hell would she do that? Also, how did I not get embalmed? None of that matters right now, Charlie. You're free. Everyone thinks you're dead. And now you can come home with me. They think I'm dead, I said, as I reflected and looked around the cemetery. I looked past Katrina and noticed that there was a trashy-looking woman tied to a tree with duct tape over her mouth. I asked, Hey, who's the whore tied to the tree? I brought her for you, Katrina said. Gee, Katrina, that's awfully nice of you, but I'm really not in the mood for a tree whore right now, seeing as your boy just dug me out of my own grave. Charlie, she's not here for you to have sex with. She's here so that I can feed you. You are weak and you need to start drinking blood. Well, as long as it isn't something weird, I'm on board. Also, as long as it doesn't take too much energy because I don't think I have any. Can we just go back to your place? Yes, Charlie, but you must feed first. And that's it. There you have it. The story of how I became a vampire. I apologize if I rambled on a bit long, but there was a lot to cover. Please join me next time and I'll tell you the story of my first kill. Spoiler alert, no matter how evil you think vampires are, it's very hard for most of us to take a human life, even when we are no longer human ourselves. My first kill still haunts me to this day. I've never forgotten the look on her face when she realized what I was and when she realized what was going to happen, that she was going to die. Till next time, I'm Charlie the Vampire. I wish you all a good night, and if you want to get in touch with me, Just search for Vampire with a Podcast on Twitter.